The son ran away from home to be free, but found himself a slave. Yet as soon as he returns home, he finds that the freedom he was searching for was there all along. Please do take a seat. Many thanks to Jonathan and the choir for all their hard work yesterday and their leading of us um, this evening. I find myself strangely wanting to kind of sway in the pulpit, um, so I'll try and discipline myself uh, so I don't make you dizzy. Um, and as I try and do that, um, could I ask you, uh, for your part, uh, to grab uh, a Bible from the pews and look up that reading we had earlier on from Luke chapter 15, as this is a reading that gets us right to the very heart of what the gospel is. But before we look into that, let me pray. <coughs> Father God, we thank you so much that you love us and that you reach out to us and speak to us through your word, the Bible. We pray now that you would help us understand what you want to say to us from it this evening. Amen. Well, here's a little question to kickstart you off. Are you a pirate or a policeman? Are you a rebel or a rule keeper? I mean, what are your instincts? If there's a boundary that faces you, do you find it's a challenge to see how far you can kind of stretch it or, or get beyond it? Or do you instinctively want to keep yourself and others within it? Are you a pirate or are you a policeman? Maybe when you're growing up, some of you, this might take a little bit further thinking back than others. But as you were growing up, were you the one who was always getting into scrapes and egging others on with dares? Or were you the one who stood on the sidelines, maybe holding the jackets, trying to stop others from getting sucked in? Pirate or policeman? Still not sure? Well, then let's try out case scenario number one. You go to the kitchen bin to put some rubbish in it. Flip it open and you see it is really, really full. Do you, A, <laughs> shove it down a little bit more, muttering to yourself, oh, there's always room for a little bit more, and then stick your rubbish in and close the lid, if you can. Or B, empty it, muttering, why does it always have to be me? But going to the lengths of also replacing the bin liner. <laughs> Scenario number two. You go to see your teacher or tutor to ask them a question. When you get to the room, they're not there, but you can't help but notice that they have left next week's exam paper lying on their desk in open view. Do you, A, sneak a look and copy as much as you can till your hand hurts, or B, back out of the room, preferably with your eyes closed so you cannot see a thing? Third, final scenario. You're getting money out from the cash machine. You ask for 30 pounds, and the machine gives you 60. You try again, this time asking for 50. The machine spits out 100 pounds. Do you, A, keep taking money till you bleed it dry, <laughs> or B, go into the bank and report the fault instantly? Pirate or policeman? Well, it's not hard to see which is which from that, so we won't do a kind of mostly A's, mostly B's things. But they, these, these two groups of people represent groups of people who are listening in on Jesus in that Bible reading we had earlier on in Luke 15. You can find them there at the beginning of that chapter. They're the tax collectors and sinners who were all drawing near to Jesus in verse 1. And the Pharisees and the scribes in verse 2 who are muttering that Jesus has got his sums all wrong. This man receives sinners and eats with them, they said. Embezzling tax collectors, prostitutes, unclean lepers. How on earth could Jesus reach out to and accept the unacceptable? They were baffled. So Jesus tells a story to show why his friendship with sinners was so important to him. And like all stories, it's a story from life. And like all of his stories, it's a story from life that illustrates things about our spiritual lives. Luke 11. Luke 15, verse 11, even. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. Now the father stands for God, 
the two sons stand for us. And looking at this story is a bit like looking in a mirror. Somewhere in the story you will see yourself and where you stand with God. So, enter. Stage left. Firstly, the lost son. Verse 11 again. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. The younger son's a pirate, isn't he? Clear as day. He's bored of home. He feels restricted, hemmed in. He longs for his freedom. So he marches up to his dad. He goes, uh, Dad, Dad, you know that life insurance policy that you took out? Yes, son. Well, I'd like my share now. And the father says, well, actually, son, those things don't really mature until I'm dead. <coughs> yeah. Well, that's it. You've got it. I want you dead. You see, this son is saying to his father, I want your money, but I don't want you anymore. Now, I'm the father of three children. Some of you may have met uh, Lucy and uh, Jamie and Kate, and you know that I love them to pieces. And it would devastate me if one of them was to come toddling up to me and say, Dad, give me everything that's coming my way. I'm leaving. It would also be kind of funny, um, because I'm not quite sure how far Lucy and Jamie would get on their scooters. And Kate is still at that, she's still at that stage where you know, she, she kind of falls over every ten steps she takes. I can just see her stumbling her way down the, the path with a, a fistful of cash wadged into her nappy. Um, <laughs> but I can't think about anything more devastating than hearing your child say, the only thing I want from you is your cash. And yet, embarrassingly for us, that's often how we treat God. Remember that Jesus is saying the Father stands for God, the two sons stand for us. And by nature, we all treat God as the younger son treats the Father here. We want life and everything that God has created for us. We want his gifts, but we ignore the giver. And our slogan is there in verse 12, isn't it? Father, give me. You just give me what I want and stay out of my way. And I guess we've got to stop there and ask, what is it that is so attractive to us about life without God? Well, it's independence, isn't it? We're happy for God to be there, just so long as we can do what we like. So we say to God, I, I don't need, need you. I can make it my own, on my own. I don't need some heavenly parent telling me how to live. I'll be the boss. And just like the younger son, we walk down the path from our father's house with the remains of the life insurance in our back pocket, convinced that freedom will lead to pleasure. And pleasure will lead to happiness. Only it doesn't. Because it's the wrong escape route. Check out verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So he turns his back on the father, thinking that life would be better. And at first it's a blast. He's absolutely loving his independence. He's got everything he's ever dreamed of. Sex, alcohol, popularity. He's having the time of his life. But what he found is that wild living never leads to lasting happiness. In fact, the party leads to a pigsty. He's squandering not only his money, he's squandering his life as well. He's only got one life and he's wasting his. It's desperate. He left home to be in control, and now he is out of control. He left home to find freedom, and now he finds himself, ironically, a slave. And the end of verse 16 is really striking, isn't it? He was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. He lived for pleasure and finds himself surrounded by people just like himself. They're takers, not givers. And that's an incredibly lonely experience. I wonder if there's anybody here tonight who finds himself experiencing that. I had a student interviewed a few years back about how she came back to God. She'd arrived at university from a Christian home, not really quite sure what she believed. She got involved with a bloke and sooner or later they started sleeping together and they slept together for the first two years of her time at university. This is what she said. 
All that time I felt dirty and used and trapped. But I was too frightened to say anything. Because, of course, the official line was, we're all just having fun. Now, I'm not going to perpetuate the myth that sin isn't pleasurable. Sin often feels good. You know that. I know that. Yet in the long term, if we keep living life without God and his loving standards, we destroy ourselves. We destroy ourselves with greed, anger, bitterness. We destroy ourselves with lust, jealousy, selfishness. You may not be in the pigsty yet, but that's where we always end up if we run away from the God who made us. And it's from there, it's from that pigsty, at his lowest point, that this lost son comes to himself. He comes to his senses in verse 17. Now many people these days see, think that to be a Christian you've got to switch off your mind and, and drop it in a goldfish bowl and, and stop thinking. Well this guy, he begins to think. He begins to think. And as he does so, he thinks to himself, I'd be far better off at home. And so he sets off back to, secondly, the loving father. And I've got to ask you, what kind of welcome do you think he should expect? Imagine it's you for a moment. Mike, put yourself in his shoes. Imagine it's you. You take the car, you crash the car, you waste all the money, you disgrace the family name, and then you return rather sheepishly back to your father with a carefully rehearsed apology. Don't you think there would be some conditions on your coming back? <laughs> Dead right there would be. You can't drive the car. You can't hang out with those friends. You're on dishes for a month. You had better keep your bedroom tidy. You're not going to talk to another girl until you're at least 41. And don't you give me any of that attitude. You'd expect there to be conditions, wouldn't you? You see, the younger son found himself in a place where he was no longer accepted once the money ran out. Because he was surrounded by what we are surrounded by, which is conditional relationships. We will love you if. That's the message we get so often from all around us. We'll love you if you dress the right way and you hang out with the right people. We'll love you if you're good looking, funny, likable, popular, sporty, caring. We will love you if you're bright, successful, hard working, get into the right university, like Newcastle or Northumbria, for instance. Do the right kind of job. We will love you if you say the right politically correct kind of things and you don't rock the boat. Because all around us we find conditional love. Love which teaches us to say, unless I impress, I will not be loved. Unless I'm lovable. I will not be accepted. But not so with God. The son heads back to the father, rehearsing his lines. Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I'm no longer worthy to call your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. But the father's already out on the porch with his binoculars, scanning the horizon. And he sees him. He sees him coming. And what does the father do? He just stand at the porch, step back, fold his arms, go, <laughs> <laughs> this is very good. <laughs> oh my word, this had better be good. No, what happens? Can we see it? While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, blink. <laughs> you might just miss how outrageous this is. In those days, older men never ran. It was considered beneath you, shameful, embarrassing. In this culture, a father running was about as unlikely as seeing the queen break out into a jog. You ever seen the queen running for a train? No, me neither, and there's a reason for that. But this father doesn't care what the neighbours think. He throws his dignity out of the window over his lost son returning. He runs to his son, throws his arms around him, and he kisses him. And the word for kiss here is, is continuous. It means he kissed him and he kissed him and he kissed him and he kissed him. He literally smothers him with kisses, which if it's your mother dropping you off at school is deeply, deeply embarrassing. But if it's God welcoming you back home into the fold, it shows just how much he loves you. Because what we're being taught here by Jesus is that this is what God is like. He's like a father watching day in day out for your return I don't know about you but after all the things that I've thought and done and said over the years I know that all I deserve from God is his censure and his condemnation but the amazing thing is that although we might have forgotten God although we might not have thought about him for days on end God never forgets us 
He never forgets us. He is a loving God who longs to forgive and welcome us home. And this is where Jesus writes himself into the story. As God made forgiveness and a way back to him possible when he sent his son into the world to pay for our sins on the cross. He sacrificed his dignity and he ran out to meet us in continuous kisses when he sent Jesus to die the death that we deserved for the way that we treated him. So all we need to do is come to our senses and return to God in humble repentance. And it's not criticisms and conditions that will greet us, but an overwhelming celebration of love. I mean, that's what this lost son gets, doesn't he? In fact, the father's love is so overwhelming that the son can barely even get his lines out. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And he began to celebrate. The son ran away from home to be free, but found himself a slave. Yet as soon as he returns home, he finds that the freedom he was searching for was there all along. As he's free from other people's opinions and expectations, what conditions he's going to have to meet to be accepted. Because with the father, he is loved unconditionally. He's free from fear of the future, where his next meal is going to come from. Because with the father, he dines on fatted calf. He's free even from guilt, the guilt of wasting his life and letting his father down. As the father welcomes him back, not as an unworthy slave with a debt to pay off, but as a precious son. You see, real freedom is found at home. In fact, the message Jesus wants us to get here is real freedom is found with God. And God alone, God is he's not some celestial killjoy up there in the sky looking to ruin life for us. He wants us to enjoy life. And far from him being a threat to that, Having God back in his rightful place in our lives is the key to that. That's certainly my experience, and any Christian that I know would tell you that. To which you might say, well, that's all fine and well, but (laughs) this has got nothing to do with me, Ken. I haven't gone off the rails like a younger son and wasted my life in wild living. I haven't killed anyone. I don't drink, smoke, do drugs, or play with matches. I read my Bible and come to church pretty regularly. I don't like, like, like Cliff Richard, but generally speaking, I am one of the good guys. <laughs> well, that turns our attention from the pirate to the policeman, doesn't it? And it brings us thirdly and finally to the loyal son, as I've named him. As there are two sons in this story, aren't there? And it's my suspicion this evening that, that many of us might be much more like the elder son than the younger one. At first glance, he seems a totally different kettle of fish to the younger son. He's a fine, upstanding moralist. He's a dutiful child. He's joined the family firm, and he's working hard. He's a bit of a swat, and you could maybe say he's a bit dull. He needs to get out a bit more. But he seems to have lived a good life. He's nothing like his brother for a minute. But he's nothing like his father either. The younger son returns. The father's glad. The brother's angry. The father greets him with open arms. The brother with angry fists. The father says, my son. The brother says, this son of yours. As he's not even willing to be part of the same gene pool as him. And let's be honest, if this was happening in your family, you'd be a little bit ticked too, wouldn't you? If you're the oldest son, you'd be thinking, Daisy is being fattened up for your bar mitzvah, or maybe your graduation, or some kind of big celebration occasion like that. But now all of a sudden, Daisy's dead. She's on the spit roast because Lamo brother came back. It's nuts. <laughs> Verse 28, but he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and and treated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. And I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. I'd say that. You'd say that. It's not fair. I've been doing this. They've been doing that. It's not fair. But once again, blink, and you will miss the outrageousness of what the older son is doing here. In our culture, it just seems like he's speaking his mind or asserting his rights. But in Jesus' culture, he was insulting his father. 
He refuses to go into the biggest public event the Father has ever laid on. He remains outside the door, publicly declaring by his absence, my father is an idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. In fact, he doesn't even have the decency to address him as father. He, says, he just says, look, look here, you old fool. You see, this isn't the loyal son at all, is it? As without ever leaving home, the older brother has found himself as far away from the father as the younger one was in the pigsty. There are two lost sons here. And either one of them could de- deservedly be turned away for the, for the way that they have treated their father. And yet, and yet, and yet, the father treats the elder son with just as much love and generosity as he did the younger one. Son, he says, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So if you can't relate to the younger son, could it be that you're an older one? If your morality makes you feel superior to others, maybe you're an older son. If your religion is all about obeying God to get things that you think you deserve, perhaps you're an older son. If your relationship with God feels cold and distant and being involved with church feels more like slavery than a party, older son? If in any way you think that you can do things to make yourself more acceptable to God, then you are an older son. And this is the sting in the tail of Jesus' story. Remember how I said at the start that Jesus is telling this story to show how his friendship with sinners was so important to him. Well, here he's saying, you're all sinners, every one of you. You all need what I've got to offer. There's not one of you that doesn't need me to go to the cross to pay for your sins and make you acceptable to God. There is nothing that you can do to pay for your sins yourself. Let me pay it for you. I'm going to give you everything I've got so you can come home. And it doesn't matter where you are tonight, whether you're just a hair's breadth from turning your back on God or you're perhaps maybe, maybe in the distant country having a wild time or you've hit rock bottom and you're in that pigsty or you're the older son who's stayed behind me you're just wishing you had not. It doesn't matter where you are. For the message Jesus calls out is the same for all of us. Come home. Come home to God and he will generously give you everything you need. Come home when you find God's wisdom, his power, his love, his joy, his peace, his patience, his presence. He is there at home ready to welcome you into the one thing you need most. A living, breathing relationship with him. Come home. Because all it takes to do that is to come to your senses and pray, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am so sorry. Please have me back. Let's pray that that right now. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this insight into the love that you have for each one of us, that whoever we are, whatever we've done, you are for us. There are ways that we have run away from you or served you begrudgingly, which leave us far from you. Forgive us through the blood of Jesus and bring us home. And we pray for ourselves, not merely as individuals, but we pray for ourselves as a church that we would like you Reach out to and love and welcome prodigals, the runaways, rather than being the cause of their running away in the first place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.